Welcome into Locked On Knicks. Jalen Brunson goes for over 40 again, putting himself in some historic company. OG Ananobi looks completely himself again, and your Knicks blow out the Chicago Bulls. Talking it right now on Locked On Knicks. You are Locked On Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, welcome in to Locked On Knicks. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. And I want to thank you for making Locked On Knicks your first listen today and every day. Whether you're checking us out on your favorite podcast platform or taking in the sights and sounds on YouTube, we appreciate you making us a part of your daily routine. Make sure you hit that auto download function on your favorite podcast app or the notification bell on YouTube so you never miss an episode. We are here for you guys five days a week. I'm Alex Wolf. I'm editor-in-chief of Knicks site, The Strickland, which you can find at thestrick.land. And your New York Knicks win 128-117 to over the Bulls. Dominant fashion. Uh, stark contrast to what happened last week against the Bulls, where the Knicks unfortunately lost that game in disappointing fashion. Uh, and I would say OG Ananobi's back to being himself and Jalen Brunson just continues to amaze. But let's real quick get into the standings first. I think this is probably the most important thing to watch right now. So the Magic lose last night. So the Knicks now hold sole possession of the three seed in the East. Uh, the Heat won. So that does not quite guarantee a top six seed for the Knicks just yet, but it is getting close. Uh, probably by the end of the next game uh, for both teams. We'll know for sure if that's the case. They are just one game behind Milwaukee for the two seed now, uh, the Knicks are, and one game ahead of the Cavs and Magic. Uh, um, if I'm not mistaken, the Knicks do not, well, I know for sure they don't hold the tiebreaker over the Magic, but they do hold the tiebreaker over the Cavs. So that's uh, important to note, but they're one game ahead of both of those teams just in the, the pure win-loss column of it all. And they're one and a half games ahead of the Pacers, two and a half ahead of the Sixers, and three ahead of the Heat right now. And like I said, holding the third seed now at this particular moment. Obviously, things are still uh, very much in flux, and and that's something that Gavin and I are going to get into on the next show. Uh, you know, just kind of getting into the permutations of what could lead to the Knicks' ultimate seeding in the playoffs and all that stuff, but. Yeah, for this game, uh, Knicks took care of business. They didn't fall into the trap that they have lately of falling down early. They just took charge in this game and just never looked back, which was what was needed here. I mean, this was a bad team that they're facing. Um, you know, not not a, and they were missing Io Desumu. They've obviously been missing Zach Levine for most of the season. Like, this is not a team that should be beating the Knicks. Um, you know, even without Julius Randle, like they're back to full strength minus Julius now, and, and they've proven to be a really good team. Uh, in that regard. So, I mean, it, this is not a, a game that they should be losing, and this time they did not. Uh, a couple, you know, big statistics I thought in this one. The Knicks get 31 assists, which is almost a third more than their season's average. They average around 24 and a half um, for the season. So a pretty big, uh, pretty big jump in assists in this game. I thought the ball was moving really, really well on offense, and there was just very little standing around. It was seemed like everybody was in constant motion, either on cuts or working their way around the perimeter. Just a very, uh, very satisfying game in that regard. And, and just felt like everybody knew exactly where they were supposed to be on the floor at any given time in this game. Uh, interestingly, the Knicks got out rebounded again, uh, 39 to 31. And that's, that's a decent amount less rebounds than they normally get. But I think, uh, it's pretty easily explainable by the fact that the Knicks are normally a big offensive rebound team. And considering the Knicks had a 50, 40, 90 game in this one as a team, uh, they shot 55% from the floor, 47% from three, 95% from the free throw line. Um, you know, that's going to make it so that you don't get as many uh, offensive rebounds when you're just not missing shots. So I think that could probably go a long way towards explaining why they lost the rebounding battle. Uh, and ultimately had a lot less rebounds than usual. So unlike the last game where it was kind of like that was the final nail in the coffin that the Bulls out-rebounded them so much, this game didn't really matter because all the shots were going in. Uh, Tibbs also went with an eight-man rotation in this game, which I thought was noteworthy. Um, you know, right when you start getting to the point of the season where you think things are figured out, he 
throws a throws a little monkey wrench in there and changes things up again. Uh, so I, I think that it seems like Tibbs is treating these last number of games basically as the unofficial start to the playoffs. Uh, I mean, I guess maybe he's looking at it as we've got to secure our seating. You know, the Knicks might be looking at the the grand scheme of things and saying, hey, two or three seed, I think, is the place to be. You want to avoid that that Boston side of the bracket. Um, and then you also want to, you know, find yourself in a position to host a first round series because we know how how much of a, you know, uh, a big thing that MSG, you know, at home for the playoffs can be, especially for these guys. You know, they are within striking distance of the two seed. And I, I if I'm not mistaken, the Bucks and Magic are going to play each other at least one more time here coming up. Uh, which means that there's a chance that you know that there could be some immediate movement in the standings there, and and you know maybe some more losses inbound for Milwaukee as they kind of continue this this late skid. Giannis Antetokounmpo is out with uh, a strained calf now. There was reports saying, oh, it's definitely not his Achilles, but that means that means it's pretty bad. Um, you know, if they're even entertaining the possibility, so uh, he probably will miss the rest of the regular season, and if that's the case. There's a potential opening for the Knicks to get that two seed now, um, which again, you know, we're going to have a whole episode just dedicated to that coming up. So I won't uh, stress the point too much, but yeah, Tibbs went with an eight man rotation in this game, clearly getting ready for the playoffs. Jalen Brunson, Dante DiVincenzo, OG Ananobi, Josh Hart, Isaiah Hartenstein start. And then everybody in that starting lineup, except for Hartenstein played 35 minutes or more. Uh, Mitchell Robinson gets 20 minutes off the bench. Deuce gets 22 Bojan Bogdanovic only comes in for nine minutes. Uh, so that means did not play coach's decision for Presh Sachua and Alec Burks. Seeming like maybe they're out of the rotation at this point, which is interesting because we saw just last week Tibbs' insistence on playing Precious and getting him some minutes and matching the two big lineup that the Bulls were going with, which they weren't able to go with in this one because of Andre Drummond uh, turning his ankle pretty bad at one point. But, uh, you know, we saw... Precious get a good amount of minutes against the Bulls, and the Knicks ultimately come up short. So it was interesting to see he's totally out of the rotation at this point. But uh, also, Jalen Brunson doing his thing, of course. 45 points, 8 assists, 13 of 24 shooting, shot 7 of 12 from 3. So Brunson ends with 12 free throws attempted in this game. I felt like this was, uh, this was a, a big stat to bring up because we've been – talking about how he was not getting enough respect from the refs that, you know, Tibbs finally started kind of speaking up on it. Uh, Brunson himself was sort of speaking up on it a little bit in his own way of basically just saying, just watch the tape. Um, but yeah, 12 free throws attempted. He makes all 12. He's had 10 or more free throw attempts in each of his last five games. So I think pointing out injustices works, you know, uh, putting pressure on the NBA and their officials seems to have worked in this case. And Brunson's getting more, uh, more foul calls when he's getting fouled, which is often. Uh, the increase, increase in free throws probably also explains why these 40-point efforts he's putting up just seem so nonchalant, um, you know, compared to some of the other games. I mean, for example, the 60-point game, it was like, or 61-point game, it was like he had to make every shot of that. You know, he only got six free throw attempts. And, um, you know, this time around, getting those free throw attempts, getting the the opportunities to just quietly score some points, uh, you know, it's, I think it's bearing out in while we're watching now that now it's like, oh, you had, uh, you had 40 points on 24 shots, I think. Yeah, it was his total. I mean, it just, it, it's, uh, it works well when you, you're able to take some free throws and supplement actually making the shots on the floor. Uh, stat, history, whatever. Uh, here he joins Patrick Ewing and Bernard King as the only other players in franchise history to have multiple 40 plus point back-to-back -back games in a season. So he's had multiple times where he scored 40 points back-to-back. -back. Uh, he's now done that twice. And uh, Patrick Ewing and Bernard King had done that in their mid-careers as well. Um, his three-point shot really is coming back as well. I was curious what his uh, percentages are looking like lately because it seemed like there was a while where he was sort of uh, not hitting as well on his threes, which was, yeah, I wouldn't say concerning, but it was you know less than ideal. But 40% on seven and a half attempts in his last 10 games. So I'd say that the three point shot is fully back at this point. Again, he, he shoots seven and 12 from three in this one. Uh, also, the eight assists. I mean, just he continues to step up his game, both scoring and assisting. I mean, he is really, truly the number one option right now. Uh, my 
my one colleague at the Strickland, Matthew Miranda, wrote in their recap uh, the other day that he's sort of starting to resemble Allen Iverson in some ways, the early 2000s Iverson, except for with a way better supporting cast. And I kind of feel like that's pretty a pretty apt comparison uh, at this point, especially without Julius Randle. Like Brunson is really taken on the brunt of having to do everything and is doing it extremely well, uh, being the top point scorer by a wide margin, being the top assist man, having the ball in his hands for just an obscene amount of time every game. Um, he's, he's doing fantastic with it. And I should note he did all of this in this game, the 45 points, the eight assists with one of the better wing defenders in the NBA, Alex Caruso, shadowing him pretty much all night. So uh, just a Herculean effort by Jalen Brunson in this one. Uh, and he continues to just absolutely crush it. Uh, but OG Ananobi crushed it as well and really looked like he's finally fully back from that elbow ailment. Um, Josh Hart had a fantastic game. Dante DiVincenzo as well. Um, Isaiah Hartenstein did some really great things. So there's a lot more to talk about when I get back in just a sec. But first, I got to let you all know that today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. And Game Time is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to the first pitch. And with killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets. I know I'll be taking advantage of that. You know, in addition to being a Knicks fan, I'm a Mets fan. And uh, that's pretty tough this year so far. They're not doing super great. So I think tickets are going to be pretty inexpensive pretty soon. And I know the game time is going to be there for me when that happens. And, you know, I, I work pretty close to the city. It's easy for me to get on the train and just hop the seven line and, uh, you know, get my way out to, to City Field any given night. So I'm definitely going to be taking advantage of that once those ticket prices continue going down, the worse the Mets are. And I'm going to go eat some really good food. The Mets have great food at their stadium if you've never been there. Uh, I'm going to, you know, use game time to pay as little as possible to get in the door and then go pig out with that saved budget on the fantastic food there. They have a burger with like lobster on it this year. It's crazy. Uh, so other things you can you can count on from game time, last minute deals. You can save up to 60% off buying last minute for sports, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. You can get flash deals, save even more with exclusive in-app deals and select seats ahead of the game or event. And you can get zone deals. So you can save even more when you choose a section and let game time choose your seats so take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time download the game time app create an account and use code locked on nba for 20 dollars off your first purchase terms apply again create an account and redeem code l-o-c-k-e-d-o-n-m-b-a locked on nba for 20 dollars off download the game time app today last minute tickets lowest price guaranteed all right and i'm back in to keep talking through this big Knicks win over the Bulls. Uh, we got OG Ananobi as the second leading scorer in this game. Uh, about time. It feels feels like it's been forever since we've seen a, a big OG scoring explosion like that. Uh, you know, he's obviously always a, a big plus minus player. Uh, you know, he's going to give you some, some really great, um, you know, box score numbers in terms of, uh, you know, his impact stats and stuff uh, doesn't always, you know, score the most points or whatever, but always makes an impact. But in this one did both uh, had 24 points, shoots 10 of 18 from the field four six from three. And more importantly, he scored nine of the Knicks first 11 points in this game uh, and did it in emphatic fashion. I mean, he was just cutting right to the hoop, putting the ball on the floor, got a big dunk at one point on a nice cut, um, you know, a couple layups and hits a three just single-handedly made sure the Knicks wouldn't have another slow start to this one. And I think that really made all the difference for the Knicks in this game. Also, the three ball is looking really smooth. It doesn't look like there's a hitch or discomfort in a shot at all anymore. You know, I think that's been the case for the last few games anyway. Like, I don't think that since he came back, I've seen any indication that there's any discomfort there. But, you know, it's still, it seemed like he was rusty just in the traditional sense of the shot not going in. But it's really good to see the shot going in, and I'm sure it feels great for OG as well. The Knicks are now 17 and three with OG Ananobi playing. Uh, so that's just an insane stat to think about. Uh, just how impactful he's been. I mean, the fact that you know he's only played in 20 games also seems crazy too. But 
Um, you know, it's so great to have him back and playing as well as he is again. Uh, he was second on the team with a plus 12 as well in 35 minutes. Josh Hart wound up with a plus 17 in the plus minus, but he played 46 minutes. So 11 more minutes to, to juice that number up a bit. You could argue that OG was the most impactful presence uh, once again in this game, uh, just by virtue of what he was bringing on both ends of the floor. I thought the his attacking off the dribble was really key early as well. He burned DeRozan really bad to the point where I was rewatching some of it to get ready for this episode. And they had the Bulls uh, clips, you know, from the Bulls broadcast on the uh, NBA.com box score. And <laughs> on, I think it's third make, the one layup uh, that he got in, the Bulls announcer was like, you got to just start switching on Ananobi. Like, you got to get more defenders on this guy. He is torching whoever's defending him. Well, it was DeRozan for a large part of the beginning of the game. So, uh, yeah, he was he was absolutely torching him. And, you know, if the, it basically, I think, showed if teams aren't going to take him seriously as he's out there is, I don't know, I mean, he could technically be considered like the fourth option on offense sometimes. I mean, if depending on how you value Josh Hart and Dante DiVincenzo versus one another and versus Ananobi, like I think we could universally say that Isaiah Hartenstein is the fifth option. But, I mean, he just – he. Uh, if he's the third option, fourth option, whatever you want to say he is, and you're putting like your fourth best defender on the floor on him, OG's got the ability to burn that person. And, and that was what we saw bear out in those first few minutes. I think it was honestly really good scouting by the Knicks too. It seemed like that was a matchup that they really wanted to exploit early and say, hey, like let's not have Brunson try to take on the whole brunt of all this early against one of the better defenders in the NBA. Let's like take advantage of the bad defenders out there. Uh, I would say my only gripe with Ananobi in this game, and this was like a gripe that I had when I was even checking over his stats and stuff when the Knicks first traded for him, and I was like, hmm, I don't really love that. I, I noticed once Ananobi starts really feeling it, like, you know, he makes a couple shots, hits a layup or two, whatever, his default go-to move is just like dribble into the lane, pull up midi, and, I, and he just doesn't make a lot of them. Like, he doesn't shoot a high percentage. I think he shoots in the 30s on those shots for the season. Uh, so I really wish that he would just not do that. Um, but, you know, it is what it is, I guess. Um, you know, he's he's going to take those uh, take those middies sometimes. But I wish he would just replace those with getting all the way to the rim because a few of the times he took them, I was like, you know, if you just kind of got a shoulder down and then went up strong, you could probably get a foul call here and then get some free throws. Uh, instead, he's, you know, he kind of just bails out and then decides to go for a pull-up and, he just doesn't hit a lot of them. So uh, that's my only minor gripe. But otherwise, this was just a fantastic OG game. And uh, you love to see him getting back into the 20-point the scoring category again. Uh, Josh Hart had another fantastic game as well. Another near triple-double. 17 points, 13 boards, 7 assists for Josh. Uh, one turnover also. Only one turnover compared to 7 assists. That's fantastic. 6 of 7 shooting. 1 of 1 from 3. I mean, he played about as close to a perfect Josh Hart game as you could ask for. Um, really good thing that he wasn't thrown out in the first quarter for an accidental, you know, connection of his foot with someone's face today. Uh, that that was clearly a huge thing that, you know, made the Knicks lose to the Bulls in the last game, was losing Josh Hart that early. because He's been such a key part of just everything that they're doing right now. Um, again, he played 46 minutes in this one, so, you know, he – he made his mark on this game. Um, but, you know, I thought he had very similar, very similar energy from like, from like Josh Hart, OG Ananobi and Dante DiVincenzo, who I'll talk about in a second in terms of approach, like minus the three point shooting for Hart. That's obviously not something that's a huge part of his game, but, you know, being in the corner is a big part of uh, Dante DiVincenzo's game and of uh, OG Ananobi, you know, to find their, you know, spot in the corner and, you know, be ready for a potential pass and a potential three point shot out there. Um, but otherwise I thought that it was just constant motion. Like Hart was, Hart just never stopped moving. He would not let the ball touch his hands for too long before passing it. Uh, so, you know, he would get the ball, get going downhill and then look to kick out to the perimeter or find a cutter or just go up strong himself. It was just very good decision-making game from him. You know, obviously if you have a seven to one, assist to turnover ratio in any given game that's going to be the case but i just thought this this game really stood out as far as his passing um had a really nice look to brunson for the dagger late in this game too so played a key part uh where with about two minutes left you know the bulls had been like kind of knocking a little bit here and there uh you know threatening to maybe get back into the game a little bit 
And uh, at that point in the game with about two minutes left, Hart just drove in, kicked it out to Brunson, who hit a three. I think it put the Knicks back up by like 14 or something at that point. Um, so it kind of stymied any potential final run by the Bulls. Uh, just fantastic play from Josh Hart there. Dante DiVincenzo had a great game as well. So I want to talk about him. Isaiah Hartenstein. A little exciting uh, consumerism news for a cool Knicks product coming out that uh, I think some people might be interested in and could maybe give me a replacement for my my uh, one thing on my backdrop here. Uh, and then also just a, a quick reminder about the schedule coming up and what we're going to be getting into with all that. Uh, so I'll get into that in the next segment. But first, this next segment is brought to us by our sponsor, BetterHelp. Sometimes we all need the opportunity to get something off our chest, big or small. Certain things can really start to get to you, and it's important to let that out, especially to someone who's unbiased on your life. So today, I want to say how I really feel about something. You might even be thinking about the same thing this week. And, uh, you know, <laughs> this copy always tells me to talk about, like, sports or whatever, and, like, if I'm mad about the Knicks or whatever. Well, there's not really anything to be upset about with the Knicks right now. So, you know, I'm going to I'm gonna just instead talk about what I usually talk about, which is the the plight of, you know, the podcaster here. Um, just the, the feelings of wanting to make sure that people like your work, the feelings of, you know, is what I'm doing matters? You know, is it resonating with people? Uh, do people enjoy listening, hear me talk, you know, like especially these solo episodes. It's so uh, it's a vulnerable position to put yourself just on camera and, you know, talk for freaking 30 minutes. Um, so, you know, it, I always that's the sort of stuff that keeps me up at night. Um, you know, it's the sort of stuff that I struggle with constantly in this line of work. And, you know, I know it's pretty trivial and very much a first world problem in general, but you know, it's it's something that probably would be better served talking about in therapy, the sort of anxiety that I feel as a podcast host, uh, you know, and, and making sure that I resonate with people and all that stuff, um, which thankfully you guys are all always super nice in the comments and always tell me, assure me that you enjoy listening and all that stuff. So I always appreciate that. But therapy can be different for everyone. Most of us have bigger problems than our favorite sports team or our podcast woes. And it's important to get things off your chest every once in a while. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule. Visit betterhelp.com slash locked on NBA to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash locked on NBA. All right, and I'm back into. Finish talking through this game. Dante DiVincenzo, big game, 21 points, six assists, three of nine from three, but eight of 15 overall. So, you know, didn't really have it going by his standards from three, certainly sopped up the attempts and drew the attention of the defense, which was necessary. Uh, but, you know, ends up with a really good shooting line overall, just by virtue of having a really complete game. Uh, I thought he got out and transitioned nicely, did that early for a, for a nice layup, but otherwise just kind of, Got to the hoop on quick cuts. He had a couple nice backdoor looks, uh, including he had a really big dunk on a pass from Brunson early on in this game that was sort of a tone setter. You know, I think the Knicks in general came out wanting to make a statement in this one. Like we saw a dunk from Ananobi. We saw a dunk from DiVincenzo. We saw him just sort of pick apart Chicago early. And I think the Knicks were definitely feeling some type of way, you know, maybe a little ashamed of losing to this team on Friday and wanted to come out and just sort of immediately assert dominance in this game and and take over and you know they certainly did that um but late in the game too i thought divincenzo had a really great play where he and hart flashed some chemistry so hart got the offensive rebound uh off of a miss and divincenzo just sort of like was standing sort of near the top of the paint um you know up near the elbow there and just patiently sat there must have made eye contact with hart at some point you know to sort of convey like hey i'm coming in and then waited for the perfect moment when the defense converged fully in on Hart, just dove to the hoop then, gets a nice pass from, from Hart there, finishes a layup. That's just the sort of chemistry that we're seeing out of these guys, you know, the, the Villanova trio in particular, but really everybody on the team because they all seem to just be gelling so well. But those guys in particular, like Hart, DiVincenzo, Brunson, they just sort of have this like sixth sense for where the other one's going to be. Um you know, and that bared out on that play. I just, I don't know, that one stood out to me and was uh, one that won't necessarily make a highlight film normally, but, you know, it's just one of those little plays that over the course of the game adds up and, you know, is, is something that's pretty unique to a team that's this well, you know, meshed together. Um, he also 
had his passing on display with those six assists. Uh, I don't think there's anything. I mean, there there was like one pass early on where he hit on an OB on a, a nice like threaded needle for the for one of his layups on a cut that sort of stood out. But otherwise, it was just sort of head up passing, always looking around for you know someone to kick the ball to, and you know that's sort of the case for the whole team in this game, but definitely for Dante DiVincenzo. Then uh, Isaiah Hartenstein, 11 points, five of five shooting for him, six assists in 28 minutes. Uh, you want to talk about head up passing and great shooting and everything else. He kind of brought a little bit of everything in his own special way. I think he's just becoming such an, a consistent offensive force in every game. Like he's not just scoring either. You know, it's like the scoring is great. Like he's shooting. I looked it up because I was curious. It feels like he's been putting up so many like perfect or near perfect scoring lines lately. He's shooting 77% in his last 17 games. So like almost a quarter of the season, he's shooting close to 80%, which is crazy to think about. Um, but the assists too, I mean, I thought he was just, he was passing the cutters and looked great as always on that, but he's also just like so adept enough with, or adept with the ball that like he can give you both an assist and a screen assist at the same time where he's, he's gotten really good about, you know, he gets that kind of bailout pass on the perimeter and he'll fake like he's going to put it on the floor and sort of start dribbling and then just bring it towards his man, you know, dribble maybe once or twice and then just like essentially hand out, you know, put it to the side, give it to them on a silver platter and set just a rocking screen uh, to get his guy free, whether it's Deuce McBride, you know, he does this with Deuce a lot. He does it with Brunson sometimes, does it with DiVincenzo. Like he's just so good at, you know, that that quick little like one or two dribble or sometimes not even a dribble, but just sort of like a ball fake, you know, stand there, freeze the defenders a bit, let his guy come to him and then just hand it off, set a bone crushing screen. And set up a you know points that way. It's just it's very very valuable what he does there. So I love that out of him. There was a couple such instances in this game. Uh, if I'm remembering correctly, out of his six assists, one was one of those like you know handoff screen assists uh, for Deuce McBride. Another one was for Divincenzo in this game. And I might even be missing one other, but uh, those stood out to me. And that that's something that he's really perfected uh, over time. Uh, so in another note, uh, something interesting that you guys might want to look out for today, uh, Slam Magazine is releasing a cover with Jalen Brunson, Dante DiVincenzo, and Josh Hart today. So that is pretty cool. They announced that last night, or at least they heavily implied it. Um, so maybe check that out. I'm certainly going to be getting a new one for my backdrop, I think. Uh, I think it's about time for the We Here one to to retire, uh, be put into storage and, uh, you know, be cherished for a lifetime, but, uh, get replaced by, by a, uh, newer one with the current Knicks on it. So, uh, that'll be really cool. So keep your eyes out for that in the meantime though, uh, or not in the meantime, in the future, I guess I should say, uh, next two games back to back tomorrow and Friday. So they're going to be on the road in Boston on Thursday, and then at home versus the Nets on Friday, I've got the pleasure of going to that game. So I'm looking forward to that. Hopefully a big Knicks win. Uh, then the Knicks will close out with the Bulls again at home on Sunday. So that's your final three games. Two out of three, very winnable. And possibly three out of three, very winnable, depending on how, how much the Celtics decide to rest their guys. I wonder if there's a conspiratorial, like if I'm putting on my you know tinfoil hat, if... Uh, if the Celtics might actually rest a lot of guys against the Knicks in the interest of keeping the Knicks on the other side of the bracket. Cause I think of all the teams that the Celtics could potentially face in the second round, you probably don't want the Knicks high on that list. Like I don't think any team really wants to face the Knicks right now. They're just clicking on all cylinders and um, you know, they've had, obviously they had the kind of rough stretch prior to these most recent wins, but um, you know, I think, I think the Knicks are looking like a pretty dangerous team that's starting to gel right now. Maybe the Celtics say to themselves, ah, I think we'd rather have, uh, you know, Cleveland or Orlando or whatever other team that we can kind of force down into that, that four spot rather than, you know, the Knicks there. And, you know, maybe they end up resting, say like Porzingis and, you know, Drew Holiday, Tatum, something like that to just sort of get ready for the playoffs. But we'll see. Um, but yeah, uh, otherwise two very winnable games after that. Gavin and I are going to do a show tomorrow where we sort of break down those permutations of how things could work out and, you know, where the Knicks could end up finishing and all that good stuff. But until then, uh, thank you all for listening and we'll see you tomorrow. Peace out.